Welcome to Pathway. We're so glad you're with us today. If you're new here, we'd love to get to know you. We invite you to fill out a digital connect card on the PCC at Home app or pccfw.tv or text the word connect to Pathway text number. To all of you who have continued to give support financially during this time, we want to say thank you. We're so grateful and we want you to know that from online worship to Pathway groups to community outreach, your generosity has made ministry possible. If you'd like to give, there are several ways you can do that. There are give buttons on our website at pccfw.tv and on the PCC at Home mobile app. You can also text the word GIVE to our text number, or you can mail a check to the PCC office. For all the latest COVID-related updates, be sure to visit our website. Just click the red banner at the top of the page to view new announcements and find quick links for Kid City Online, content for students, adults, and more. You can also access all of this through the COVID link on the PCC at Home app. As always, our services will continue to air at pccfw.tv, so if your health is vulnerable, we hope you'll continue to be part of our online community. Thanks again for choosing to show up here.
this week, as I had some time to just think about the weekend and our message series from Graves into Gardens, I came across it, a very timely quote from the late Billy Graham. For the believer, there is hope beyond the grave because Jesus Christ has opened the door to heaven for us by his death and his resurrection. And this morning, there could be a lot of mixed emotions as you walked in this door today. Maybe you're in a place of mourning and you're walking in a very difficult time in your life. We know, though, that God comes along beside us. He sees our hurt. He sees our pain. Maybe you're on a mountaintop. You're in that garden of life. You're looking back at all of the ways that God has been faithful to you time and time again. In Psalm 145, we are reminded, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day, I will praise you and extol your name. The Lord is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. Great is the Lord. My friend, it does not matter where we are in our life and the difficult circumstances that we're going through because we serve a God who sees us, who knows us, and loves us. And we're going to continue singing as Jessica leads us. Great are you, Lord.
It's always such a great, I love that introduction. Hey, uh, I want to reinforce what Brian said about raising uh, financially healthy kids and stop by the, the kiosk on the way out. Uh, this, the speaker that's coming in for that weekend is going to be absolutely tremendous and really help all of us as parents of what it means to kind of give our kids a really good financial future and really keep a balance and understanding as to where, where all the resources come from and that ultimately they come from God. And then I also want to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers that are here. We wouldn't be here without you. And uh, so we're just glad that you're here this evening as well and through this weekend and uh, thankful. How many of you love uh, movies? You love the movies? Yeah, anybody love the Marvel movies? Oh, yeah. I don't. Um, I actually don't like the Marvel movies. I, I go to sleep at Marvel movies. I, I like, I, if we go to a movie theater and we watch a Marvel theater, a, Mar a Marvel movie, I kick back in the recliner and I'm out within 10 minutes. My kids are like, Dad, why did you do, why do you go to these things? Why do you go to these things with us? You don't watch them. I said, I take a nap. It's the best nap I've had all week. And uh, so I don't like those movies, but I like true movies. I like docu-movies. I like movies that are all about taking someone's life and telling the story in that person's life and I've shared this with you before. Back a few years ago, I, 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 I captured these movies that are all about climbers, you know, mountain climbers. Uh, the Dawn Wall, which is uh, which really the story about Tommy Caldwell. And Tommy uh, went alongside the, the El Capitan uh, and climbed this. And as you notice, he's got a rope to support him along that way. The other movie that came out actually before this was called, um, was called Free Solo. And uh, Alex Hammond is the one who did this one. If you notice, Alex does not have a rope. Alex is a free climber. He climbs just with his fingers. He's crazy. And, uh, and then the last one that I found this past year was the alpinist. And the alpinist is, uh, you can see a, a rope that's there, but actually uh, for Mark LaCru, I think is that's how we say his name, he actually climbs these ice formations without a rope and with his fingers, and all that goes with it. And, uh, and when I'm watching these movies, I've been watching each one of these, and, and I think about it, the thing that oftentimes just kind of makes me think about this is what happened in their life that they would take such a risk of climbing without any rope? I mean, did they have a bad mom? I don't know. Uh, did they have a bad father moment? Probably. But what's true is there actually is some, some situations that take place in their life all the way through. Tommy Caldwell was actually captured by a group of terrorists when they were out of climb one time, was held captive for multiple weeks and was finally released. And then on one particular climb, he actually, he actually lost his index finger on a climb, which for a climber, you have to have your index finger. He was thinking, that's the end of my climbing is what it is. And yet he actually pushed his way through that as well. Alex, Alex just had a life of a lot of brokenness within his life growing up. And, and it pushed him to kind of figure out what am I going to do and how am I going to, how am I, what am I going to accomplish with my life? I can, I know I can do something. He wasn't a great student, but he accomplished his task through going free solo. Uh, Mark on, on the alpinist, absolutely, you know, when you look back at his life, life of drugs, life of a lot of craziness, just a very unusually thinking individual who found his place of safety on these climbs. Many times when they're making this documentary about him, uh, they had all of these places figured out where they're going to film, and he would disappear. Not just for a week, not just for a month. He would disappear for months. They couldn't find him. They couldn't track him down until they found out that he was climbing somewhere on the other part of the world. His whole premise was, I don't want a film crew with me. This is about my experience, not the experience of everyone else. And, and so, you know, that's why I love docu, docu movies. I mean, uh, Marvels, that's fine. Docu movies, I'm right there with you on that all the way through. Well, in many ways, what we're doing here is we're looking at kind of a docu story. And uh, when we look in the book of John, we've been walking through these very personal defining moments uh, in the life of Jesus that transformed the lives of, of these disciples and, and many others that, that saw the resurrected Jesus. It changed them in such a way that, that it radically moved them out of their fear into a posture of tremendous boldness and confidence. We said at the beginning of the series, we're going to look at, these, at these, these, these moments that actually John records for us. And, and there were at least 10 over 40 days uh, of these appearances of Jesus after, you know, through the resurrection. Over 500 people at one time, Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians 15, and that each one had a reason. We've been talking about each one having a reason. And uh, the one point that I gave to you, and Brian reinforced it last week, and if you have not listened to Brian's message, you need to listen to it. It says, when you embrace the promise of the resurrection, 
the entirety of your life is transformed by the presence, the peace, and the power of God. And, and we know that those who experienced a resurrected Jesus firsthand were radically changed. Again, we're talking about it. Uh, so far, we've talked about how they went from fear to a place of peace, how they went from doubt to belief. Brian did a tremendous job last week of taking us into doubting Thomas's moment of belief. And this evening, I want to talk about going from death to life. And we're not going to look at a resurrected moment, but we're going to look at what John really has to say about the resurrected Christ. Uh, take your Bibles, turn to, to John chapter 20. Let me just give you a little bit of an understanding as to why we're staying with John uh, in this series. And that is that, that John was, he was just an ordinary, everyday fisherman who really witnessed the life of Jesus firsthand. He had this unique friendship with Jesus that was deeply personal. He saw these firsthand miracles of Jesus. We'll talk about that. And heard the teachings of Jesus. He witnessed the agony of Jesus. He was there beside Jesus' mother when Jesus was dying on the cross. And, and he saw the risen Jesus. And when he writes the book of John, he's an old man. Matter of fact, uh, all, the other, all the other apostles, except for John, have already died. And many of them died horrific deaths. And now he's living in Ephesus. And he, he writes, he's probably looking through the gospel of Mark. He's probably looking at what Matthew had to say and what Luke had to say. And, and John pens a totally different letter than the other three. He actually leaves out the birth of Jesus. About 90% of what the others say, he doesn't place within the context of, of, his, of his book here. And, and really what he's doing here is John's writing to a crowd of Jews who don't yet believe. He's writing to those who did believe in Jesus and to kind of reinforce that belief. And he's writing to those who, who were at a distance, the Gentiles, and, and those who he wanted to understand the full breadth of the love of Jesus, but also understanding just who Jesus is and what Jesus did. And so at the end of, of chapter 20, John writes these words. He said, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, in just those two verses, what John says to us about Jesus is this, is that, that Jesus demonstrated who he was through his signs. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. He talks about the fact that this truth and, and, and what Jesus came to do is just not for just you, but actually it's plural. It's for you. It's for all of you. If you will just embrace this truth, it will change you. He talks about the fact that not only will it change you, but it will change your life. Matter of fact, 36 times John, John is going to emphasize the life that Jesus offers to us through his gospel. And he says, but what you have to do is you have to believe. A hundred times he gives that little word believe about what it means to believe in Jesus through his gospels. And when he talks about believe, he really is talking to two groups. He's talking to those who did believe to, again, reinforce their belief, to, to cause them to step back and remember. Remember what he did? Remember when you were there? Remember this miracle? Remember who he is? Don't forget that. Don't forget that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just reinforce that belief. And then he's talking to those who don't believe, who have not believed yet, saying, if you will embrace this truth, it will radically change your life here as well as for all, all eternity as well. And so Jesus, John shows us who Jesus is and what Jesus did in, in, in really taking us, is what I'm going to talk about tonight, in really taking us from really the grave to the garden, from, from death to life. Matter of fact, he reinforces it in his little epistle in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, where he says, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So we're taking a little interlude between the resurrection moments and experiences of Jesus to really hone in and understand fully and reinforce our belief as to who Jesus really is. He takes us from death, which is no life, to really a full life that is found in Christ. So here's my big idea for you this evening. Write it down. It says, what you believe in, what you believe in, determines the rest, your, determines what you rest your life on. What you believe in determines what you rest your, belief, your, your belief, your, <laughs> what you believe in, what you believe in, determines what you rest your life on. I wrote that, I know that, um, now I really know that. And so, what does he say here? Well, first of all, uh, what, do you, what do you believe? Well, the first is this. Who do you believe that Jesus is? Who do you believe that Jesus is? John says that he is, he is the Christ. He says, he says that, 
that, that, that, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah or that Jesus is the Christ. And when you think about Jesus Christ, Christ is not his middle name. Christ is not his last name. Uh, you know, in, in, the, in the Hebrew, we would look at the, the understanding of that of being Messiah or the anointed one. John is going to use this 19 times within the context of his gospel. And, and it's what the, the, the Jewish people of John's day, of Jewish people were looking for when Jesus showed up, is they were certainly looking for a Messiah. They were looking for an anointed one to, to come and to rescue them from the hand of the Romans and, and to be that ruler that God had promised to them. Matter of fact, uh, one writer put it this way. He says, the Old Testament people of God came to anticipate a person anointed by the Spirit who would function as king and priest over Israel. Hence, in Jewish theology, the Messiah was the person endowed with special powers and functions by God who would appear as the divinely appointed history climaxing deliverer and leader of Israel. In other words, he would be someone, but it wouldn't be God. And Jesus shows up as the Christ, as the anointed one. Matter of fact, he shows up understanding that he does fall in the line of David as God had promised David that this, this king would, as a matter of fact. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, 11, 12, read it this way, that the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you, and when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed, to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. This king will come within the line of David. And then Isaiah declares it. We know this verse, these verses, we hear them every Christmas. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And then he says, and he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So what we know to be true about David is this, about Jesus is this, is that Jesus... Jesus is in the line of David, and he is anointed, but he was not the king that Israel was looking for. But John shows us, what he shows us in his gospel, when you read the gospel of John, I'm really going to encourage you to do so, because the gospel of John is this, is this simple gospel that, uh, that it's deep enough, as, August, as Augustine would say, it's deep enough for, a, for an elephant to kind of get lost in, and yet it's shallow enough for, for just the simplest of an animal to kind of find his way through and, and stay in. It's just, it's, a, it's a just simple enough, but yet profound. And, and what John shows us is that actually there were those who recognized Jesus as the Messiah. Nathaniel, in John chapter 1, verse 49, when he says, can, can anything gum, good come from Nazareth? And the, Jesus has this conversation, and, and Nathaniel says, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. In John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman who Jesus is sitting by that well and she comes up to Jesus, a Jew, a rabbi, who would not associate with a Samaritan woman, would not even you know, spend that much time with a woman per se, but, but there she comes to him and Jesus begins to tell her things that only God would know. And she says, you are the Messiah. And he actually goes back to Samaria, to, to, to Samaria and he actually spends time there and others believe and come to the point of believing, understanding he is the Messiah he is the anointed one. Thomas, my Lord and my God, when he, when he, when he, when he recognizes and affirms who Jesus really is, that resurrected Jesus, when you think about this, even Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and then, then when Jesus dies, there's that individual by the name of Joseph of Arimathea who takes Jesus off the cross and puts him in the tomb, and both Joseph and Nicodemus were part of the Sanhedrin, the 70 of the best of the best of the ruling council for the Jewish people. They came to understand the fact of who Jesus was. And then the disciples who witnessed his resurrection certainly did. Matter of fact, some, one writer put it so well. He said, John is getting us face to face with Jesus Christ. He's showing us how he lived, what he said, and what he did. And all the evidence points to the conclusion that he is indeed God, come in flesh, the Savior of the world. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. And not only that, but John says he's also the Son of God. And in talking about the Son of God, he's speaking to the deity of Jesus. Again, fully God and fully man. 29 times he, he gives us this little phrase, Son of God. And, and matter of fact, as a, when we think about what John relates to and how Jesus relates to even God, he relates to God as his Father. And, and that was unusual within that day for a Jew to relate to God as Father. But Jesus relates to God as his Father and demonstrates, listen, he and I are one. And if you've seen me, 
you've seen the Father. And, and matter of fact, in John chapter 10, I don't have this for you on the screen, but if you have your Bibles, and, and there's a moment of confrontation with Jesus about this very issue of, of really who, are, who you are, and he's been doing these signs, as we'll talk about in just a moment. People are coming to know him. People are beginning to follow him. And then in verse 22 of chapter 10, there's a little, there's a little moment that breaks out here where there's a question that is presented to Jesus about this very issue as to who he is. It says, Then came the festival of the dedication at Jerusalem, it was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. And the Jews who were there gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. <laughs> and Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any good work, they replied but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. And he's saying, but that's, but that's who I am. That's who I am. See, here's the, th here's the deal. Probably most of us in this room, even if you're a skeptic, even if you're a doubter, even if you're going, I, I don't, I'm not sure I believe in all this stuff, the majority of people would believe that Jesus actually was a real person who lived. And as a matter of fact, if you look around this world, this world has been radically changed because of the influence of Jesus on this world for centuries. And yet many wrestle with Jesus being fully man and yet fully God. Even presidents wrestle. Jefferson, Jefferson who, who took a hold of Scripture, and what he ended up doing is kind of created his own little Bible. It's called the Jefferson Bible. Is what they, they, he didn't call it that, but, but it's the Jefferson Bible. And, and what he did is, is Jefferson believed that Jesus was a good man, but he believed in his moral teaching. He loved his moral teaching. But he spent months taking his Bible with a, with a little razor blade, more or less, and cutting out all the miracles of Jesus, anything that related to the divinity of Jesus. He just wanted to have the moral teaching of Jesus. That's all he wanted. Listen to, listen to what it is. It says, uh, Jefferson's Bible, The Life and the Morals of Jesus of Nazareth, offers further evidence of the personal philosophy that guided his public life. Any discussion about Jefferson's belief, religious beliefs must reference this extraordinary text as a primary source. He began assembling this book while he served as president, although he did not complete the project until 1820. It was a private enterprise known only to a few close associates. By removing all, ref listen, by removing all references to superstition and the supernatural, Jefferson made clear his admiration of Jesus as a great teacher, a moral philosopher, while at the same time reaffirming his belief in and commitment to the power of reason as the basis for understanding life and the natural world. He's saying, we can't explain the miracles of Jesus, so therefore because we can't explain it within the context of the natural world, they can't be true, and so I'm just going to cut them out and just make him into a good man is what I'm going to do. Warren Risby said it really well. He said either Jesus was a madman or he was deluded or he was all that he claimed to be. While some of his enemies did call him deranged and deluded, the majority of people who watched him and listened to him concluded that he was unique like anyone else they had ever known. How could a madman or a deluded man accomplish what Jesus accomplished? When people trusted him, their lives were transformed. That does not happen when you trust a madman or a deceiver. He claimed to be God come in flesh, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and that is what he is. Amen. And, and listen, when you, when you believe that, it will change the rest of your life. Because what you believe in determines what you rest your life on. So then the other question is this, and that is that what do you believe Jesus has authority and power then to do? He talks about the fact that Jesus performed many other signs. And John, even, 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 uh, even, even in the, that last part of, of, of chapter 20, he talks about the fact that I can't put everything in this letter 
as to what he did. I'm just trying to give you a little glimpse as to what he did. But he said Jesus performed many other signs, and, and there were signs that John recorded. Some say it was six, some say it was seven. I, I think there were seven, and we'll talk even about eight here in just a moment. But, but these signs... These signs caused people to wonder. These were the miracles. They caused people to wonder as they witnessed what Jesus had authority and power over, is what it was. There were seven signs that, that we see within the context of John's, of John's gospel. There's the changing of water to wine, which talks about power over quality. There's the healing of the official son, which is power over space. He didn't need to be there when that happened. There was the healing of the paralytic paralytic, which he had, been, he had been paralyzed for years, and it was power over time. There was the feeding of the 5,000, which was power over quantity. There was the walking on the water, which is power over nature. There was the healing of blind man, which is power over misfortune. And there was raising Lazarus, which was power over death. But there's also something else here that takes place. And just kind of hang with me here for just a moment. That is that Jesus is revealing in this list, really, his, his, he's revealing his authority and power over creation, that I can, I can change water into wine. And in some ways, what he's really saying is, is that when I show up, the party begins. You, you got the party when I show up. You know, we're going to have a great party. And so when you experience a life in Jesus, it's like Jesus saying, yeah, just bring out the best. I mean, let's celebrate it. There, there's that, that, that element of understanding that that when he releases someone and frees someone from demons, that, that he's able to, he have power over those demons. That he, he really is dealing with all the sin and its effects on this earth when he, when he stills the storm and when he heals the sick and when he raises the dead. There's that power over death to bring life out of the dead things. And, and there's this understanding of, of bringing even new life into play that Jesus, that Jesus offers. And these signs reveal what Jesus wants to do in you. That he wants to birth a new creation in you. That, that he wants to, to give you a way to battle your demons. <laughs> I'm not saying you're possessed tonight. I'm just saying, but we all have those things in our life that if we're not careful can take control over our lives. Our habits, our hang-ups, all those pieces of hurts that come into our lives, which we talk about at Celebrate Recovery every Tuesday night. There's sin in our lives, and he forgives us of our sin, and, and, and then he brings life out of dead things, and he brings an abundance of life into your life now, as well as eternally. And, and so each sign points to how Jesus reaches into the situations that people are facing with compassion and with action, and he enters into the situations, and he's present, and he meets their greatest needs in that moment. There's also an eighth one. There's an eighth sign. <laughs> and, and, and it really truly is the sign that changed and impacted our world. And, and the power of going from death to life, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that eighth sign. Matter of fact, again, John says, but these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And that's really the third. And that is that belief in Jesus means that you are resting your life on really four things, as I thought about this this, this this week. You're resting your life on what he means to you, on what he did for you, on what he sees in you, and what he does through you, what he means to you. You have to make a choice. Are you going to choose knowledge about a good man or are you going to choose knowledge with faith about the reality of not just a good man, but God's son who laid down his life for each and every one of you? If it's knowledge, you're never going to experience the fullness of life that, God, that Christ offers you. Matter of fact, if it's knowledge and that's all you're going to do, you'll probably go through your life and eventually you'll just forget about Jesus. I know that's true. Because Jesus had it happen to him with one of the 12 that followed very closely. I had a friend send me this this week. Think about Judas. He walked with Jesus for three years. He saw the greatest life ever lived up close and personal. He says, you can't have a better model of faith in Jesus than, 
of, of, than Jesus or a better environment for forming faith than Judas had in walking with the Savior. He directly witnessed the miracles. When Jesus fed 5,000, Judas was there. He took the bread and distributed it along with the other disciples. When Jesus calmed the storm, Jesus was there. And he was there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. You can't have better evidence for faith than Judas had. Judas heard all the teachings of Jesus too. He heard the Sermon on the Mount. So he, he knew there is a narrow road that leads to life and a broad road that leads to destruction. He heard warnings. Jesus spoke to the Pharisees. So he knew there is a hell to shun and heaven to gain. He heard the parable of the prodigal son. So he knew God is ready to welcome and forgive those who have wasted themselves in many sins. With Judas' own eyes, he saw the clearest evidence. With his own ears, he heard the, final, the finest teaching. With his own feet, he followed the greatest example. And yet this man still betrayed Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus solidified the truth that he is who he said he is, that each person who saw and embraced Jesus were transformed by gaining, not by gaining more knowledge, but by experiencing Jesus and the power of the resurrection in their lives. And every one of you that have embraced that, you've experienced it too. That's why we looked at, not to Judas, but to the Apostle Paul who, who uh, experienced the risen Jesus. His life was radically changed. And Paul goes on to write, I want to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, but I also want to know Christ, and I want to know even more so the power of his resurrection to allow it to be lived out within my life as, as Christ continues to transform me. What does he mean to you? What he did for you? Again, Paul's words, for we know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. He laid down his life for you. That's what he did for you. He went to Calvary for you. He took on the wrath of God for you and for me is what he did on Calvary. And what he sees in you. What he sees in you. It's Mother's Day. Mother's Day weekend. And, uh, you know, I, every, I come up this weekend and I haven't spoke on Mother's Day weekend in here for years. It's like, I didn't want to, I just wanted to speak on Mother's Day weekend this weekend. I just wanted to. I don't know why, I just felt like I wanted to. And I look back at my mom. My mom died when I was 27. And, uh, you know, I watched my mom battle cancer and go through all those years of cancer. And uh, when I lost my mom, I lost, a, I lost, one of, I lost my best friend. I lost a, a good close friend. She was a great friend. And mom always saw the best. <laughs> and she always knew the worst. She saw that as well. And Jesus, he sees you like no one else can. Psalm 139, Psalm 139 tells us that each one of us in this room, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have been knit together in your mother's womb. And he knows you full well. And let me tell you when that began. That began at the moment of conception. At the moment of conception, you were formed. And God's hands were on you. And God was shaping you. And you were precious in his sight. And as Jeremiah 1 says, that before I formed you in the womb, I knew you that he knew your name before your mother knew the name. And he loves you. And he created you. I'm going to take a risk tonight. Um... I didn't want to take a risk tonight. My daughter, um, my youngest, is from China. We adopted her when she's 10 months old. Her mother left her in a little bassinet beside a little, beside a little medical clinic in, in Yugon, China. And I'm certain that she put her down there on that November morning and she ran across the road and she just kind of watched and waited to make sure somebody got that bassinet. She packed her, 
she was so packed in clothes that you just saw her head sticking out. I mean, that was it. She looked like she was 20 pounds in weight. And she weighed actually about eight and a half pounds at birth. So my got her, and she went to a little orphanage, and they loved her, and they cared for her, and they watched over her. Every so often, Bell and I talk about her mom. We talk about the reality of how her mom made a choice to give her life. And she valued her life. A couple months ago, I was reading a book to Bella at night. It's 10 questions every, every teenager should ask about Christianity. It's written by Rebecca McLaughlin, who's a PhD out of Cambridge. And we got into, a, into the subject on talking about God and his love for you. And um, I'm going to read it tonight. And if you all walk out, then I won't tomorrow. But she comes to a place of, and I didn't plan on doing this. And this message <laughs> was, was planned a long time ago. So, you know, just want you to know that. And I didn't plan on sharing this tonight until uh, about 4.45. She writes, and I'm going to talk about the challenges going on in our country right now. And I just, I just want to help us here a little bit. Some people think that being against abortion means not caring about women. I disagree. Half the babies who die from abortions in the West are baby girls, and in China and India, two countries where the teachings of Jesus haven't yet made a big impact on how people think, far more than half the babies who die that way are girls. What's more, as we'll see in chapter 7, sex outside the commitment of marriage, which results in the majority of unplanned pregnancies, tends to be good for the happiness and well, tends, tends not to be good for the happiness and the well-being of women. If there's no God making human beings in his image, unborn babies are just balls of cells without infinite value. But if there is no God making humans in his image, that is also true of you and me. As Yuval Noah Harari puts it, we don't have rights any more than spiders or hyenas. Or as the character Dr. House put it in the popular TV series, House MD, you're just a bag of cells and waste with an expiration date. She says, my friend Sarah Irving Stonebreaker is a history professor at University in Australia. I met her when we were doing our PhDs at Cambridge University. She was convinced, she was a convinced atheist at that time. When she realized that atheism didn't support her belief in universal human rights or her belief that newborn babies are more valuable than animals, she started to wonder whether atheism was true. As Sarah did more research, she discovered her surprise that believing in human rights and equality, believing that even the very young and the very poor and the very sick deserved our care, had come historically from Christianity. So Sarah started considering Christianity for the first time. And when Sarah found out the truth about Jesus, her world turned upside down, and she started following him. We had a very interesting conversation that night about life. We talked about the fact how God saw you in your mother's womb and how God saw us. And the truth is that God sees you. And for some of you in this room, that's painful because of experiences in your past. I just want to tell you that God sees you, that Jesus went to the cross, that he loves you. He laid down his life for you, that he restores you and forgives you. And then what does he do through you? But these are written that they may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. When I think about this one, I think about the fact that God has so much to do in each and every one of us, that all of you are of tremendous value to him, that Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, came to this earth and paid that ultimate sacrifice for you and for me, and that he knows you, and that he knows you full well, and that he has a plan for you, and that he really does want to work through you. He really does, if you allow him to do so. But it really begins with believing in who he is, and believing in what he did for each and every one of you. Think about this. Think about those who saw the risen Savior. Ordinary, ordinary, everyday people, many who had denied and deserted Jesus, 
And when they saw the resurrected Jesus, when they saw that sign of the resurrected Jesus, their lives suddenly were changed. And by believing, they experienced a new life here on this earth and also the promise of life eternal with God their Father. And so I just want to tell you this evening that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus did rise from the dead, and that if you believe in the work that Christ did for each and every one of you, your lives will be radically changed by the power of the presence of Christ in you and through you, and he will work through you no matter what the experiences are that you bring into play. Are you thankful for that tonight? I hope you are. I hope you are. Yeah. So in many ways, um, he's kind of working through. He's working through us. He's working through us. I, I've talked a little bit, and I, I'm, I need to be done. Um, but uh, I've got a neighbor. I had a neighbor. I talked about my neighbor back a couple years ago that I ran into my 80-year-old neighbor, Carol. And uh, Carol could hardly get her garbage can back to her garage. And I ran into her and, and introduced myself to her. And um, we got to begin became friends. And her daughter lived up in Chicago, and I'd go over and help her out. And there were occasions where in helping her, on one occasion when in helping her out, she ended up breaking her femur when we were trying to help her out. And I spent the whole day in the hospital with Carol and learning her whole story of brokenness and pain and difficulty, the loss of her husband, and just a, just, just a difficult, hard life. And, and uh, I had moments when I prayed with Carol. Matter of fact, on one time in the hospital, Carol said to me, she said, I think this is it, Ron. I think I'm going to go. I think I'm going. I said, I don't think you're going. I don't think you're going. <laughs> But, but if you think you're going, are you ready to go? I don't know if I'm ready to go. Well, do you know who Jesus is? Yeah, I know who Jesus is. I talked to him all day long. I said, well, then just tell him what you need to tell him. And I sat there, and I just listened to her just kind of just pour out her heart to Jesus. And, uh, and, and then a few months ago, she, was, uh, she had had another setback, and she was in the nursing home. And one of our, one of our visitation pastors went, went and visited Carol. And in the midst of speaking with Carol, he said, hey, I just want to make sure that you know Christ is your Savior. And he led her through just an understanding of what Christ did for her. And it came a very precious, tender moment when she said, yes, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. And she did. And then a couple weeks later, she died. But I want to tell you that in watching Carol, I watched someone who knew about Jesus and had the knowledge of Jesus come to know Jesus and have new life in Jesus. And that's what Jesus, the resurrected Savior, offers each and every one of us in this space tonight. I'm grateful for that. Are you? Yeah. I am. So let's stand together and let's just kind of wrap it up with this song.
Thank you again for worshiping with us today. If you'd like someone to pray with you, there are members of our church online team or our staff who would love to do that. Simply click on the live prayer button at pccfw.tv or click the conversation bubble on the PCC at Home app. We encourage you to continue your worship through giving. Just click the Give button on the web or the app or text the word GIVE. Finally, be sure to check the web or the app for the latest updates and at-home resources. We also share many updates through Facebook, Instagram, and our weekly e-news, so be sure to follow or subscribe. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon.